Hi everyone, this is Sina Johnson. I welcome to you, uh, you to this webinar today on how to create uh, the best-in-class workplace experiences in uh, 2017. Today with uh, me presenting, we have uh, the CMO of uh, ISS, uh, Peter Angestian, and we have Jeffrey Saunders from uh, the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. Uh, I will just start off with a few practicalities. In the upper right corner of your screen, you're, uh, you should have a small control panel where you can ask questions. So you're all muted uh, just due to the fact that we don't want any background noise. Uh, but you're more than welcome to ask questions also during the uh, session and we'll pick up on those uh, at the end of the, uh, of the webinar. We will also record the webinar so uh, you can access it afterwards and we will send out information on that uh, after the webinar. So uh, welcome and with that I will hand over to Peter Ankerstjern and here we go. Thank you Sina um, and welcome to this web webinar also for my part. We are in Copenhagen, Denmark at the moment uh, so it's uh, four o'clock in the afternoon so I shouldn't say good morning but uh, good afternoon from, from our side at least. And we'll spend the next 45 to 60 minutes on presenting some of the research that we have been doing at ISS together with the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies uh, related to the facilities management and corporate real, real estate industry, but of course also related to services and workplaces, uh, especially the workplace of the future. And a logical consequence of that is, is to talk about workplace experiences and how they're shaping uh, the facilities uh, we work in, but also the way we work um, in the future. So over the next uh, hour or so, we will uh, cover how to navigate in the trends that are affecting the future of work. We'll also uh, touch upon how you can develop robust and resilient workplace strategies that are geared towards an increasingly comp complex business environment. And then finally, we will um, present uh, our input in terms of how do you design a service delivery system that creates value for both the organization and its stakeholders focusing on service experiences rather than input specific services. There's no doubt that it requires more from the facility management and corporate real estate industry uh, in the future to create best of class workplaces. Uh, we need to go beyond only looking at the built envelope and the workplace activities. Uh, we need to focus on how to balance the end user focus uh, and the end user experience with supporting the organizational strategy and also the drive for efficiency uh, within the workplace. And then finally, using service design and service management uh, principles uh, supported by data, uh, technology, and analysis to deliver experiences that are most that create the most value added for the organization and its stakeholders, uh, the people typically working uh, in the workplace. All the conclusions that we are presenting during this uh, presentation is based on um, some industry research that we have done together with the institute. Uh, we have also uh, surveyed through five reports, we have surveyed more than 4,000 professional uh, industry professionals covering facility management, corporate real estate, outsourcing and services, uh, together with the International Facility Management Association, Cornet Global and the International Association of Outsourcing Professionals. On top of that, we have conducted more than 60 subject matter interviews for people from the industry in terms of addressing and understanding and digging a little bit deeper in terms of the empirical data we have received and understanding some of the trends that we've been that we have been working with this has resulted in the, these uh, five white books uh, where we presented the latest one at the ifmas world workplace um, conference and expo in san diego in the united states um, in october uh, that's called the future of service management all of these reports are between 100 and 120 pages long. Uh, they're free. Uh, you can download them uh, at uh, the internet uh, at I either the ISS uh, homepage, uh, the group homepage, uh, issworld.com, or at Better Workplaces, uh, the, the website there also. 
so, uh, so you can do that uh, during or after this uh, webinar if you feel so inclined. Uh, we would like to start by, by this uh, great uh, quote from uh, Bill Gates and, and what he is saying is that we have a tendency to overestimate the change that will occur in the short term and then underestimate the change that will occur in the long term and we should watch out not to f be lulled into inaction uh, based on this. Um, sometimes the excitement, uh, excitement about you know, understanding some of the changes that are happening uh, uh, overtakes the uh, the reality of how quick they will be implemented, um, and uh, I think that is uh, that is happening now. Uh, there's certainly a lot of change going on in the industry, especially around technology and automation and the digitalization of the workplace. Um, but but before we see sort of the full ramification of these types of trends, it, it will it will take a little bit of time. Having said that, we also have to acknowledge that the facility management and the corporate real estate industry have really been a slow adapter of these new ways of working. Great. Thank you, Peter, for the great introduction. This is Jeff Saunders here um, from the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. And now we're going to be exploring the, the trends that will affect the future of the work and the future of the workplace. And as Peter was getting into um, earlier in the presentation, there is an increasing amount of complexity affecting um, facility managers, corporate real estate professionals, human resources, IT, uh, and the like. And that complexity is only going to increase and um, accelerate on putting demands on you and on organizations to design the workplaces that are most um, beneficial to your end users and that drive value for the organization. If we take a little step back in time, We've had a, a transition in um, an evolution in the way the workplaces have been designed um, to meet the needs of organizations. Looking back all the way back to the 1900s, you had the first introduction of the efficiency into the workplace and you had the Taylorist organization. Then you had some awareness that that didn't bring enough focus on culture and values into the organization and collaboration. So you had the emergence of the corporatist office and the Bureau Landschaft's office from Germany in the 1960s. And then came this awareness about where's the end user in all of this and how could they be better supported. In the 1990s, you saw this activity-based working, which is the stage that most organizations find themselves today, which is trying to understand the activities that end users need to be performing in order to get their jobs done and then how best to support that um, in a variety, by offering a variety of working um, spaces to support these different needs. These could range from focus work to socializing to collaboration and the like. Um, but that's not the future. The future is transitioning towards a new form of office environment, which is the experience-based office, which is a recognition that we need to bring people together um, to actually leverage on work assignments and then create a shared vision and culture within the organization so that you can bring people together, attract them to the workspace, integrate teams more quickly, and have them deliver more efficiently. So the question and the challenge is for, for facility managers, for corporate real estate professionals and IT um, companies is how do you bring the right tools to bear to not only support the activities that are being done, but also the experiences that the end users are having in the office um, during the time. And so this is, if you master that, the way to get the best in class office moving forward is focusing on managing and creating experiences for the end users in the office space. Now, the complexity of the office environment is increasing because a workplace is not just the four walls that a, that a company controls, it goes beyond that. It includes co-working spaces, public places, working from home, and all these aspects are supported by the digital sphere and digital teams that need to be brought together and supported by the organization. So what it means is now in the future is bringing different elements together by understanding the nature of work and how it's developing, the trends affecting the workplace, and the trends developing and shaping 
the needs of the workforce. Organizations can develop an understanding of what is it, what's the strategy they have for the organization to deliver value to their end users and stakeholders. What is it that they need um, for people to be doing to deliver upon that? And understanding how they're working now and how they should be working in the future. And then determining what are the facilities and the technologies that best enable these people to deliver on those strategies and actually create experiences that drive good employee engagement throughout the workday. Now moving forward uh, toward 2020 and beyond, um, there's a number of challenges that need to be dealt with um, by organizations when you think about work, workplace, and workforce. The nature of work is changing due to acceleration of, and complexity driven by globalization and technology development there needs to be organizational resilience. Technologies and communication technologies in particular are breaking down internal and external barriers within organizations and without organizations and allowing for new ways of organizing and new ways of leveraging uh, one's employees and one partners to deliver values moving forward. It's also about how can you bring other partners into bear and leveraging a community towards moving things forward. At the same time, the workforce is being um, affected. And this is all aspects of automation. So you hear oftentimes a buzzwords about the fourth industrial revolution, different jobs being automated. And what's happening is that you're having a bifurcation between um, the talents who can gain a significant amount of value and people who are being negatively affected by automation and being polarized. So how do you deliver value to your talents that you need to attract and recruit? And then how do you deal um, with the broader polarized workforce? There's an increasing number of user needs and increasing diversity and a focus on driving health and well-being. And within the workplace, there's this need to balance what are the goals of the organizations and at the same time, deliver um, better user choice and personalization while at the same time managing the environmental uh, footprint of the organization more effectively. All this is being negotiated though. The future workplace and the demands upon it are being driven by the goals of the organization. What are their business models? What are their employment practices and their need for physical space? And what are the needs of the end users they're trying to attack, attract, the workers? What type of work do they want to do? How is it changing? How much do they want to work and from where do they want to work? And in this meeting space come the requirements for the new workplace. Now, when you talk about the future of work and what's driving the needs for the future workspace from an organizational perspective, it's this a VUCA world. And a VUCA world stands for accelerating volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So things are changing in a much more dramatic fashion. The swings are much more um, higher in their variance. There's uncertainty about where it's coming from, which leads to a great deal of complexity. And oftentimes, as a business leader, you don't understand quite what to deal with the situation, so there's a lot of ambiguity there. This means that a number of business leaders want a greater degree of flexibility. Flexibility in how they manage their workplace, flexibility in the terms of the relationships they want to have with their employees. So you're talking about flexible working arrangements, flexible employment, zero hour contracts, everything to maintain a degree of agility in the organization. So this dynamic is impacting how organizations think about their strategy and at the same time how they think about their business model, their organization practices, and their needs for the workspace. So what we're seeing is a bunch of new type organization types emerging that need to be supported. And many of the organizations among the people participating in this webinar experience these various forms of workplace organization. You have many companies and private and public sector organizations, excuse me, who are um, representative of the left side of this slide. They're in command and control organizations, 
highly bureaucratic, um, also very hierarchical. But many of the new organizations that are emerging are showing new ways of organizing. Many are project-based, where they consist of several freelance organizations. Others are entrepreneurial, where certain employees are given the freedom to develop their own um, business ideas and business practices. Others are more pathfinders. They need to find their way and develop. And the last type is a more of a form of a hierarchy. That's more of organizations that are very dynamic and bring together um, different communities to leverage values. Now, these new organizations need a entirely dynamic approach to employment and dynamic approaches to space and space management. And they need to be able to attract the right talent when and where they need it to their spaces um, at a given time. So this is um, this focus on developing a resilient workplace strategy because the dynamics of the future of work and competition are so great moving forward. It requires a new way to think about how one conducts um, business and manages one's employees and workspaces in the future. Now, resilience, what is it? It's a buzzword that's flying around um, everywhere right now, but the way we define resilience at the Institute is the ability of systems and individuals to respond um, positively um, to change and have proactive adaption to circumstances before, during, and after adversity. You can't predict the future, but you can uh, work with different ways to bounce back or even bounce into a new condition depending on how um, change impacts you. And to do so, and to be proactive about it, you need three um, tools. You need your radar, you need your sword, and you need your shield. So your radar is your understanding of what's occurring in the world around you, a degree of anticipation to changes before they occur. So this bleeds into workplace management by understanding what are the potential changes to the workplace requirements, and how do you develop con continuous plans to prepare the organization for those challenges. It could be the winning of a large contract and bringing several new employees to bear, or it could be that you, there's a likelihood that you're going to lose some contracts and you actually have to uh, manage some transition of employees elsewhere. But it's also about creating a dynamic atmosphere within the organization where a great deal of collaboration, knowledge sharing, and productive social um, relationships where people know um, who is it that has the good ideas in various um, organ parts of the organization. So what you're trying to do, an innovative perspective, is create experience and cluster strategies within the workplace itself, which is using the workplace to create productive social and collaborative relationships and environments that allows the organization to operate in a much more um, dynamic and modular fashion. And to do this, you need to collect and analyze utilization of data to ensure that the workplace is continually aligned with the organization's needs. And this helps the organization be proactive in its risk management process to take its shield and really engage in how to protect the organization as best possible. So if it is surprised by what is occurring in the market around them, they can quickly adapt and adjust to what's going on around them. And in this, what we're seeing is in many organizations is that they're becoming increasingly modular. They're working in work campaigns, which are short, intense projects that are looking to achieve um, particular betterments. It requires new technologies and devices that permit better and more um, constructive collaboration and engagement. It requires a new range of collaboration models that enable the organization to be more dynamic, fluid, and flexible. And it requires a new type of management away from a focus on inputs and outputs towards outcome management. All right, Jeff, thanks. Um, so what we see in, in our industry is really three major drivers of change. Uh, obviously, as, as Jeff already alluded to, is technology and the way it's changing. 
uh, the, the corporate real estate and the facilities management industry. Uh, of course, also the workplace, especially around new ways of working or the future of work, whatever you call it. And then finally, the experience economy or, <clears throat> or especially service experiences. Uh, you can have the best designed uh, workplace in the world if, if the people servicing that workplace don't add up and don't provide a, an experience that it's at, at least at par with the design that you're having, it's, it, it doesn't really work and it, it creates that level of disconnect uh, that we need to work with. So just uh, taking, uh, going through these one, one at a time, um, one of the questions we are often asked is about you know, service robots and, and when will service robots sort of hit, hit the, the industry? <clears throat> and and the way we see it, it's it's a little bit like uh, the picture you see in front of you with the Big Hero Five. Is these types of robots that that replaces our uh, our frontliners, our our service uh, professionals. Um, that's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, there's no doubt that we are using robots, uh, but they are still expensive, especially industrial robots. Uh, and the robots you have at home, like iRobot or Husqvarna. Um, lawnmower or whatever it is, uh, they don't sort of uh, stand up to, uh, to the uh, requirements from the commercial and industrial sector. Th th no doubt it will happen, uh, but there is, it's still going to take a while before we'll see the full uh, effect of that. Uh, we are using RPA and uh, I'll get back to that a little bit later. So what is happening in terms of workplace? Well, the building is becoming intelligent or smart. Buildings are beginning to talk to us and we'll have now the technology to understand what they're saying. We're beginning to be much better at com connecting people with technology and with buildings and, and using that insight to optimize the workplace solutions. So it's about using data connectivity real time and historical. It's using insight in terms of uh, creating analysis and understanding the needs of, of the people occupying the workplace, but also um, reactively in terms of work order triggers. And then finally also uh, using cognitive and, and IoT as a predictable tool in terms of uh, how behavior is changing. So what we have seen uh, in the industry for a long period of time, especially during the financial crisis uh, that we are finally sort of uh, seeing uh, as, as something that is behind us, um, the drive has really been uh, towards driving down asset costs. It's about total cost of ownership, energy usage per buildings, square feet uh, per employees, you know, dollars spent per employees or per uh, square foot of the building, that type of thing. And that, we don't think that that would go away. Uh, that's, that, that's here to stay and that will be that efficiency uh, drive uh, also in the future. But what we are seeing is that it's it's not only about the assets, it's also about the people occupying uh, the buildings that we are managing. So it's about you know the the users, the employees of the organizations, the guests visiting, the uh, the travelers if it's an airport, the patients if it's a hospital, the students if it's a university or, or school or whatever it is, and driving up that user experience, to provide use the workplace as a means of collaboration, breaking down organizational silos. Uh, focusing on employee productivity, creating learning environments, creating communities, creating networking environments, socializing. And actually the fact that, that we are beginning to accept the fact that people are actually coming to work, not because they need to concentrate, because they can do that anywhere. And maybe they're better off doing that at home where you don't have the disturbance. But they're coming to work for different reasons, for socializing. Actually, they could come to work for having meetings, talking with their boss, uh, having the good coffee, you know, going for lunch and having a lunch experience, you know, those types of things. Uh, we do believe, and, and we can see some great research on that, that it is important in order to build organizational cultures to have your employees coming to the office from time to time. Maybe not every day, maybe only a few times a week or a few times every few weeks, uh, but, but in order to build that culture, uh, you need to have the people in the workplace from time to time also in terms of using freelancers. Now, so the way we see it, the application of big data and IoT is really about the service delivery, understanding uh, work orders and, and, and how we can work with that and optimize that. Uh, the, the obvious example that we have used for, for a little while in some of uh, the contracts that we are operating is 
um, what the customer is buying is a fresh, neat, hygienic, clean toilet, for example. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not really relevant how often you clean that toilet. It just has to be clean. And that's, that's the outcome that we're looking for. So instead of, of, of planning it and, and cleaning the toilet every hour, for example, you can put up a sensor that, that just measures the number of people who have been in that bathroom. And every time, for example, five or eight people have been there, it will trigger an automatic work order to the person nearest to the bathroom. And, and he and she, uh, as a service professional, will go in and refresh uh, the bathroom. And that's the way it works. And, and you, can, you can apply that to a number of, of things, both technically and service oriented. It's about providing predictive maintenance using real-time uh, checks on uh, equipment. For example, um, uh, the air filter in the HVAC system. Instead of changing that on a, on a regular basis, uh, you put up a sensor measuring the airflow, and as soon as the airflow changes, you know it's time to, to change the filter. So, so you can actually have a much more efficient service delivery system based on this type of technology. It's also about optimizing the building usage around space management and also about CSR. And finally, it's about productivity and end user satisfaction, um, working with touch points and using touch points to give a better workplace experience. So it's that purpose of understanding that it's not only about driving down costs, but it's also about providing a different workplace experience in order to attract and retain the talent that is critical for the organization of the future. As I mentioned before, uh, we are already using robots. Uh, we're using uh, big uh, uh, robots in the uh, cleaning uh, business, uh, for example, uh, floor scrubbers and, and industrial vacuum cleaners. And we're also using them in uh, the healthcare, in hospitals, in terms of transportation and, and portering services. But I think the most uh, uh, robot type of uh, uh, technology we're using at the moment is, is uh, robot, uh, robotic processed uh, um, automation, uh, RPA software, uh, or what we call assisted RPA, but still we believe there's a, as a person uh, involved in, the, in this uh, automation. So using smart buildings is really to predict and work with capacity needs. It's about the challenges we have in our workforce today, in the workplace today, for example, queuing up in the canteen to get lunch, it, it's not an optimal way of using your, your lunch break. You would rather have it socializing and eating your lunch, enjoying that break from work. Uh, it's about predictive resourcing and, and getting the right workforce uh, at work and at the workplace when they're needed. And then it's about user communication and, and optimizing the end user communication so we understand what is happening. So the experience-based work, workplace is really about, Jeff? Yeah, it's really about shifting this focus away from where a traditional organization has been focusing on inputs and outputs, measuring hours put in, looking at what the KPIs were coming out, and then trying to change the discussion about what is the actual outcome they're trying to affect. And what we see from the research and from the thousands of survey results we went through and interviews and things like that is that there's a decided transition over towards an outcome focus. And when you start talking about this transition from an outcome focus, it starts talking about what is the core strategy of the organization and what is the culture within the workplace and how can you start assessing what those are for delivering on value and how could you drive the right behaviors within the organization that support the types of organizations, organizational cultures one has. So the first stage of understanding um, how people, you know, the first stage of understanding a, a workplace assessment is understanding how people work and then how people should be working and what is the culture that goes in to delivering value within the organization. Is it a, a clan culture, which is a very familial oriented organizational culture that focuses a lot on teamwork? Is it a one that's derived on a hierarchical basis? On, it looks at like command and control and measuring how people are, are competing and doing values? Or is it one that's more externally oriented, looking at partnering, looking at competition, but everything is 
uh, measured by what is the value you deliver? Or is it one where it's more of this hierarchy, ad hoc, an ad hocracy, where things are done in a different way and it's about the creation and the risk willingness? It's understanding the organizational culture that you have and understanding what is the direction that you need to be taking the company or the organization to deliver value in the future and asking what is it that we need from our workplaces, our facilities, and our technology to help drive an organizational transformation in the direction that we would like to achieve. And so this requires a service collection and a number of tools to focus on what is it that the end user needs to actually achieve not only what she or, need, he or she needs to do at work, but also what they need to do to change into a more value-producing uh, employee um, for the organization. And so that requires a service management approach that focuses on the end user, what is their experience, what is their service quality, what is it that they, and how is it they like to have their services delivered to them, what degree of employee engagement do you need from your service delivery professionals to actually deliver on that? And what is the culture that needs to be put into place to actually deliver this service to this end user? So that requires setting the leadership principles, the various norms and habits, and then the sense of purpose through a mission, vision, and a shared set of values that will go uh, and assist these people moving forward. So this is pulling into a new way of working, a new discussion about how we drive and deliver values within our organization because, as we mentioned previously, there are a number of challenges within the workplace that need to be addressed. We have many organizations that need, um, and particularly during the financial crisis, was a focus on um, driving efficiency and effectiveness. But it's also a realization that people work differently now than they did just 10 years ago. Most people, even people who work uh, office-centric, are not at their desks half the time. So there's a realization that we don't need as much office space as we once did before. And then that office space could be repurposed for new uses and, devo and devoting new services to new employees. There's a significant portion of employees around the world that are engaged at the workplace and a significant number of employees who are just along for the ride or who are actively working against what the organization is trying to achieve because they're unmotivated or demotivated. So how is it that we can push that um, percentages and create more engaged employees um, moving forward? So we need alternative workspaces. We need spaces that promote a culture. We need spaces that drive collaboration and sharing flexibility, speed, and innovation and productivity. But we need spaces that drive an experience. We also need spaces that will cater for the new generations of workers that comes into the workplace, the millennials, the Generation Z, uh, those types of, of young people that are coming into the workplace. But not only facilitating their needs, but facilitating the fact that we now have four generations uh, at the workplace at the same time. So creating uh, creative, uh, individualistic uh, type of environments that, that sort of adds into the culture uh, that these uh, environments are supporting uh, the company culture, the organizational culture, is, is really, really important. Um, that, that brings us to the next issue about co-working spaces, that, that as the way we are seeing is is probably the biggest disruptive force we have at the moment uh, in the normal office space. It's not a, it's not a big trend uh, at the moment. It's, it's less than 1% of the total corporate real estate and facilities management market, but it is moving with great speed. And we can just mention uh, companies, especially companies like WeWork, uh, that has been a value, uh, valued uh, very, very high on the stock exchange, but also is, is, is providing a fantastic workplace uh, in, in some great locations around uh, some of the big cities of the world. Uh, and there's no doubt that 
that this type is it's not only a workplace that they're providing it's it's a sense of community it's a it's a network it's a it's a lifeline for new startup companies uh, that they're pro they're providing events uh, we, we had an opportunity to talk to one of the event managers that we work in London uh, last year uh, and she defined her job uh, not as a facility manager but really as a community manager and especially an event manager which I really think is exciting and, and, and provide some input for where the future is heading. Now, uh, the last opportunity I just want to uh, briefly touch upon is really the service, service experience. And uh, uh, this picture you see here is very intentional uh, because I think that's sort of the epiphany of, uh, of what, kind, what is experience and how does it work. Uh, maybe it's easy to, uh, to have the window cleaners uh, dress up as uh, superheroes uh, as they wash the windows of a children's hospital, uh, as this example uh, is illustrating. This is uh, one of our window cleaners in a U.S. organization that are uh, clean, cleaning windows at, a, at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, I believe it's in San Francisco. Um, but I think this is what it's all about. It's, it's, I would love to say that this is a consequence of a, of a strict ISS process they've followed, but, but it's not. Uh, but it's, it's about some people who understand the bigger purpose of what they do. And these window cleaners took it upon themselves to create a special moment for the kids in the hospital um, whenever they came to clean the windows. So they dressed up as superheroes. And, uh, and it's just a fantastic example of how do you create an experience. Now, this is for kids and it's easy to relate to. But you can, you can paraphrase this. You can do a similar thing in the workplace. In, 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 at the office and in the manufacturing plant, if you give people the permission to think creatively, think outside the box, and understand the bigger purpose of what they do, because the window cleaners at the Mayo Clinic, in this example, is just not only cleaning windows. They're healing the kids that are hospitalized, and they're creating that little break in a in a in a probably a hard day of of treatment. Uh, where it's actually fun, uh, where somebody swing by the window, repelling down, looking at spy as sp Spider-Man or something like that. We've done a lot of research uh, within the organization here in terms of how does employee engage engagement drive customer experience. Uh, there was some great research done in the uh, late 90s uh, from Heskett, Sasser, and Reichelt, uh, the service profit chain. So, so this is really just uh, documenting uh, what they also. Uh, sort of found in their research, and we can do that on our own data. But there is, it's probably no surprise, there is a very strong correlation between employee engagement uh, and customer uh, experience. Uh, and then using that sort of intersection to say, what is it in our employee engagement that actually drive quality and and satisfaction at the customer level? And it is really, not to be overly uh, psychological about this, but it is really the ambition and perceived role we have as individuals and especially as frontliners, service employees, and the way we're recruiting people in, but also the behavior and attitudes in which you meet other people and you engage with the users uh, of, of, the, of the workplace. So when you understand that and you understand how that drives, then it's, it's really about understanding what training and people development can do, how to add purpose to the job roles, how to create a sense of belonging and, and make people feel part of a strong team and a part of a success, and then also empower them, as, as the example with the window cleaners for, uh, from the US, where they contribute and also feel valued and appreciated at work. I think that's the core of any service uh, delivery model. So service excellence uh, and service experience is really about the people factor and creating these wow moments in the touch points. And just to illustrate the touch point, this is a generalistic approach to, to a touch point analysis. Uh, obviously, that has to be created for each individual uh, organization uh, that you work with. But it's really understanding how is the workflow during the day from arriving at work, that, which can be a tedious process. You're just finding a parking lot that is close to wherever you work entering into the building, you know, being greeted and welcomed by the reception, having a great moment to start off the day that will probably influence a big portion of the day going forward. Being in the building, working, getting hot drinks or cold drinks, whatever it is, it seems like, at least in the Western world, that get drinking coffee is a very big part of the success criteria of what we do. 
uh, at work and, and the coffee moments are quite important. But then working at the building, going for lunch, having a, a, a great lunch where you can meet with your colleagues, you can socialize, you can get some great food, you can get some, you can get re-energized. Uh, having meetings, conferences, events that works, you don't go into a, a meeting room where the AV equipment doesn't work, the uh, the markers on the whiteboard, they, 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 they don't work, and some of these things that you can actually manage some of these experiences. And the key here is really to understand the experience that you want to get, what, what, what defines a great meeting, understanding that and then working back for, backwards from that and saying if that's the experience we want people to have, then what do we need to do in the delivery process according to that. And that also goes for the last uh, couple of stages in this, uh, uh, sending receiving packages and mail and, and then leaving from work, heading back home, uh, bringing, your ho bringing home whatever uh, you want to bring home, you know, lunch from the canteen if, if you have that uh, set up uh, and that service at work. Um, and then also understanding what else can we do for our employees at work. Could we bring, you know, laundry, dry cleaning, could you do a gym, uh, uh, you know, wash the car uh, while people are working. And what are all some of these, what, what are some of the additional services that you can actually set up as a part of a working environment to create a great workplace experience and create a place where people will want to come to work, not because they have to, but because they want to and it adds value to their personal lives and the way they work. Yeah. And so when you start talking about what is the differentiating factor that separates the best from the rest. And it's this combination of, of course, the facilities, the technologies, but it's about this people centricity that brings it all together and understanding what is it about the user, their user journey, how they work, how they want to receive and consume services that will actually help organizations build attractive workplaces that help bring uh, employees um, to the environment, to the workplace environment, actually help them integrate quickly into teams and actually help them perform better in the future. So this is all about architected service experience, service design and service management. And this helps drive the worker experience because this doesn't happen by accident. It's actually very, very intentional. So you need to analyze. You need to be co-creative with user involvements and actually understanding what the end users are saying and wanting and needing and bringing that to bear. It's also about trying new things and rapidly prototyping or prototyping um, and delivering uh, new and interesting services. And if they work, fantastic. If they don't work, move on. So implementing on the go. And as this diagram on the right is trying to demonstrate, is choosing where you could intervene at the most value generating touch point. So if you understand at the moments where you can drive the most satisfaction, it's about designing the service to really shape and change those for the most positive benefit to the organization and for the end users themselves. And so if you'd like to learn more about this, there's a lot of five workbooks, white books that we've uh, produced together with ISS, along with a number of articles, cases, and the video where you could download and, and watch that online um, where you unfortunately could not see at this time uh, due to technical issues. The link is below at www.betterworkplaces.issworld.com or servicefutures.com. We hope you have found the uh, um, presentation, interesting and informative, and we are open for questions um, from you and are looking for an, forward to an interesting debate. Okay. I will just uh, thank you for that. Um, so we have a few questions that have come in during the, uh, the webinar. Thank you for that. And if you have more, please go ahead and type them in. We still have a, a, a few uh, minutes for that. Uh, one of the questions that we have is whether activity-based and experience-based working is that global trend, and uh, this person is actually asking towards, uh, is interested in hearing about Asia and, and maybe the Middle East. Yeah, um, there is uh, differences in culture, 
um, in especially national lo local culture affects um, the focus on activity-based working in, and uh, new ways of working because there's an aspect related to how you sh demonstrate authority within organizations. Some cultures tend to be more hierarchical and that represents itself in how they design the workspace. So the boss gets a big office and you know there's a cultural aspect to not wanting to give up one's office space to to show that uh, you work with the regular office employees. So there is that tension there, but among many of the new industries that we're seeing in technology, in creative industries and the like, just the requirements for how one works is at tension and at odds at that. And so you're seeing a transition away from that in, in how these offices are designed. So it's a challenge in Asian and Middle Eastern um, cultures compared to other parts. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question we have is uh, whether we think that the uh, emphasis on workplace experience is uh, increasing and what really is causing this, this trend of, of change. Um, I think it is. Uh, definitely that's, that's what we're seeing and what we can see, uh, especially from, from our customers, especially from customers like uh, GoDaddy uh, and, and these types of organizations. Um, and I, I do believe that they are sort of uh, trendsetters and, and running ahead of, of many other organizations and industries out there. Um, I think it's it's really about that that the, the notion of work is changing and, and the new generation are coming into the workplace and there is a tremendous war for talent already uh, that, that you're simply forced to create different working environments for different categories of, of employees uh, and, and that notion about the experience becomes a very big part of that. And also, if you look at, at many of the value-generating uh, professions moving forward, um, they're the ones that have uh, much higher skill demands. And those, those types of skills, the schools and educational systems are not producing enough of them to meet the demand. So that competition for that talent group is very, very intense. And so you need to be able to deliver excellent workplace experiences to attract that talent group. Otherwise, they're going to go somewhere else. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yet another question that we have here is um, how facility managers can make sure to personalize services in this increasingly automated world. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, but but I think it's using the uh, the insight and the, the data you're collecting for for something other than just you know driving down cost uh, what the insight will give you and what we have seen and some of our customers that we're working with is that the insight gives you a prioritization of what is actually important for the end user and for the, the customer the decision makers and once you have that prioritization you can begin to adapt your service setup and your service delivery system accordingly to what is it that really drives value for the end user um, it, it, it may not be that, that, that you need two hot dishes in the canteen every day. You could have, I don't know, every other day. It may not be that, that you know, uh, the, the, the way you're cleaning uh, the offices or maintaining the offices needs to be done in the way you have done it the last couple of years, that you can change it according to, uh, to the needs of the organization. Um, I think that's certainly one thing. Yeah, and automation is, again, just a tool. So you have to figure out where is it in your process where it helps you reduce costs for areas that maybe people aren't as interested in so that you can repurpose the, the money and the resources to the areas that actually drive value to people. So it's that intentionality, it's yeah. that purpose, it's about finding where you could drive cost savings where it doesn't add much benefit to the end user and then repurposing those uh, resources to where it actually drives benefit for for the worker in the workplace. But also understanding, you know, what is the profile and the culture of the organization. I think yeah. a great example is Cisco. Uh, I know the Berlin office uh, here in Europe uh, is now equipped with all sorts of technology you can imagine that they have automated the uh, the, the reception and registration uh, process completely using uh, facial recognition and that type of thing. And I think that fits very well to a technology organization like Cisco. I don't think it would fit to a consulting company or a bank or something like that. So it's also understanding what kind of behavior, what kind of brand, what kind of culture are you driving at and supporting. Yeah. 
if you look in our uh, service management book from the Better Workplaces website, we go through archetypes about how people want to consume um, services in the future. And if you understand what type of end users you have working at your workplace, are they people who, for whom the best service is no service, as the Cisco example is, or are they people who want to have uh, human contact um, when they come in in the morning and say, hey, Jeff, you know, how are you doing this morning? Oh, I'm doing great. You know, there's some people who like that. So it's about understanding who do you have at the office mm -hmm. and tuning your service delivery to that. And that actually might tie into the next question that we have here, which is about what are the skills and what kind of expertise is key for facility managers to, to sort of meet the needs of, of uh, the future workers. Yeah, I think uh, I think actually that we, we touched upon that in our previous report, uh, yeah. The Future of Outsourcing, where we say, uh, I think historically facility managers need to get out of, uh, of, of you know, the technical, the engineering mindset. There's nothing wrong with engineers and you still need that sort of base competence, uh, but you need to add on top of that a more sort of psychological understanding, as Jeff was saying, what's happening in, 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 the, in the workforce and in the workplace that you're supporting. What kind of people and what kind of archetypes do you have there? Also, maybe an anthropological uh, uh, point of view, saying what's happening in the organization, what type of changes are, are the organization going through, and how do you work with change and change management? Because that's going to be a huge component going forward, because the, the workplaces that we know and we've seen today, they're not stale. They're going to change, and they're going to change again and again and again over time. So having that flexibility. And then finally, having also the visionary role in, in terms of foreseeing uh, what's in the future, uh, that, that entrepreneurial mindset in terms of adapting to new technologies that are coming into play because that trend is also increasing in tremendously that you know you get new apps, you get new technologies, you get new ways of automating uh, uh, the services that you're doing and having an ability to work with them and implement them relatively quickly uh, is also mm -hmm. a skill. Yeah, so yeah, it's a, an integration of the hard technical with the soft skills yeah. moving forward. So, you can almost call it a techno anthropologist if you want to go down that road. <laughs> yeah. But also, I think also yeah. a lot of uh, facility managers have, uh, and I can see from my own organization at ISS, is that they have that very strong technical background, and that's great. But but then also having that people component where you actually manage a service delivery yeah. system and, and having those people management capabilities, which is a very, very big part of that, because those are the ones that are going to be at the cold phase of you know meeting the customer, being on the floor, meeting the employees of the organization, bringing this to life, uh, and that 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 ability is also a, a very very important one. Okay, it's not just speaking to the heart, but and not just speaking to the mind, but also speaking to the heart. That's kind of what this is all about. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that we have here is if we're seeing an increase in workplace wellness uh, programs or other areas where you can can be complementing the employee uh, programs that you might have. Uh, are we seeing an increasing amount of those? Yeah, uh, having been to a lot of conferences, especially at the uh, IFMAS World Workplace and Cornet, the Global Summit and European Summit and what have you, uh, health, well-being and wellness seems to be on top of the agenda. And that's great news because, I mean, it's not only about the design of the workplace and, and, and shifting into activity-based style mm -hmm. of working environment or experience-based style working environment. It's also about looking at the, uh, the, 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 the people aspect, uh, you know, having healthy building but also having healthy people working in the building and understanding as an organization that's actually part of the responsibility. So having people that have an, have a, have an opportunity to eat well in the canteen, to get nutritious food, to, to exercise, to have a desk that is uh, where you can stand and work. Uh, there's a lot of talk about, you know, uh, sitting is the new smoking. Uh, so, so I think organizations are also realizing uh, the responsibility in having healthy people and having healthy work processes uh, and, and making sure that that there is a choice at the workplace, that you can take the stairs instead of the lift, that you can stand up working instead of sitting, you can have a healthy alternative uh, at lunch uh, and not only uh, pizza and burgers or what have you. So uh, so I, I absolutely think that this is a very, very big part and we'll see more of that, especially as we move into the experienced workplace, uh, that you'll see running clubs, bicycling clubs and stuff like that. That's part of the 
uh, corporate responsibility of how people are work, how organizations are working with their workforce. You know, also you'll see it um, particularly going as uh, the workforce ages in many economies around the world. So when you start talking postponing the retirement age to 73, 75 years old in some countries, the discussions are going there. Then you have to start thinking about how do you serve the needs of those workers, not only the needs of Generation Y or the Millennials or Generation Z, the young and dynamic, but the people who are also uh, going to be working in the workplace much longer than they have ever done so before. Okay, thank you. So we'll just take a last question here. Um, so do you see a trend where building owners are customizing their assets to meet the new workplace? Uh, yeah, you see that um, actually what's happening is when um, companies are seeking to increase flexibility, they actually don't want to have long-term leases in the way that they had previously. So they didn't want to engage in a 10, 25-year lease. They want to have something that's more flexible and adaptable. So you see building owners, they're starting to service this need and taking inspiration from co-working um, companies and designing workplaces where you have uh, you know, opportunity to leave your lease within a month's notice. They start seeing how could they drive shared services among buildings, tenants. So what they do is, is they're creating a, a kind of a, a cushion for the customer that makes them feel, okay, I have the ability, if I need it, to get out of my lease, to do something different, to be more dynamic, scale up, scale down. Um, but you know, sometimes they don't take advantage of it. But that offer is there, and that gives the building owner an advantage. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to customize to their end users' needs, which are these organizations that are dealing with a much more volatile, competitive business environment where they continuously need to adapt to changing environments. OK. So I think we're through on the questions for today. So I just want to thank everyone who uh, joined us today, everyone who uh, sent uh, questions. We'll make sure to send uh, the presentation to everyone afterwards uh, and a recording and uh, definitely also the video that uh, we failed to show today uh, due to uh, small technical uh, problems. Um, so thank you also to Peter Angostian and uh, Jeffrey Saunders. Um, and um, yeah, we'll talk to you soon again. Bye. Bye. Bye.